for all four of these school options, there's going to be massive sacrifices that you have to make if you want to raise a biblically centered family that's well educated. You can't drive luxury cars, have a gigantic house in a desirable neighborhood, <laughs> go on all your dream vacations and have your primo education all in one pot. It does not work financially for most people. I don't, it kills me that people can't get this through their head. That you have to make choices. It's so frustrating when we work with families and see it. Oh, they've got to have it all immediately. No, that's not the way it works. Hi, I'm Steve. For nearly 30 years, I've been a pastor and disciple maker. And what I really love doing is helping guys be better followers of Christ and better leaders at home. I'm Mark, a certified financial planner with an MBA and an Ivy League degree who wants to make sure you're making the smartest money decisions possible. And this is Abraham's Wallet. Join us weekly and create a culture in your family of multi-generational prosperity, spiritually, relationally, physically, intellectually, and financially. Run your home and your dough like a biblical boss. Mark, as we record this, we are careening towards the end of Lodo Feb. The oh man, the pantries are getting a little bit bereft of their stores. The NBA has just come back from its All Star break, so I was very interested to try to watch some NBA games last night. My snacks that I had before me for this watching evening were I have a soda stream make your own bubbly water machine I'm drinking plain water with bubbles in it that I made in my kitchen and I had found in the back of a pantry some old stale matzah that had to be from last year's Passover and it and you know why it hadn't been eaten, Mark? Because it was the terrible unsalted kind of matzah and I'm sitting Gross. there chomping on that, watching NBA games. That's how pathetic the end of Lodo Feb is. How, how's the end of your Lodo Man, Feb? I got to tell you, I want what you're experiencing for my family. <laughs> but I feel like I Elijah in the desert, like we're laying on, on our side and the ravens just keep bringing bring us. Last night, we were planning on raiding the pantry beans and rice style. And, and my wife comes home and goes, one of the nurses at work, she's a Mexicana, and she just handed me this giant bag of homemade tamales. Wow. So it was tamales for dinner. And we tonight, it's Shabbat, right? And we were like, well, we don't really have a normal fancy Shabbat, but there's some chicken in the freezer. You can yeah. throw that in the smoker and maybe we'll yes. season. I thought, okay, the kids roll their eyes. We've had a lot of chicken. There was a lot of just frozen chicken breasts in the freezer so this was kind of a standard and I opened the freezer and there staring me back in the face that I've forgotten about is a pack of nice delicious thick ribeyes looking at me that I had frozen so I said I guys you need steaks it's gonna be steak for dinner tonight which delighted the whole family but I just you know we had friends go out of town and they said we're leaving for two weeks Come raid our fridge. It's full of fresh vegetables. That's amazing. And it's been like that for us the whole load of Feb. So what I will say on the positive yeah. is we've run across a couple insanely humongous needs already where it wasn't an option to say, well, we're in load of Feb, so you can right, wait right, until right, the end right. of the month. And the, no, we've ripped off definitely more in checks already during load of Feb for meeting needs around us in our community then right. we will save in load of fit so well maybe it's just the the lord taking care of us while we try to do that but i have asked myself if this is load of should we just do it all the time because we have not <laughs> suffered at right. all <laughs> well we always have those moments and i'll describe one of them that happened to us as well and and they, they seem to happen in february we know we don't it's not normal in july for people to bring us food you know but it seems to happen in february and every time it happens we all throw up our hands and say it's a lodo feb miracle that has become a cliche like a hanukkah miracle anyhow 
The Lodo Feb miracle for us recently was a former employee of my wife at her event planning business. She's spending a lot of time at home and she's decided she would like to start selling her handmade bread, but she wants to get her system down. So she's just making a lot of high quality bread and she's going, would you guys take some, some of these loaves off her hands? I mean, you'd have to know this lady, you know, when you do the razor blade and you can like cut like flowers and stuff into the top, she's doing all of this stuff. She gave us a loaf that was a chocolate loaf that had chunks of chocolate, you know, all throughout. So it's like, well, there's our bread and there's our dessert. You know, she's, she keeps funding us with uh, bread and we feel it is a low dough miracle, but yeah. We forge onward. Yeah, this is the the final week of Lodo Feb. So next time we meet, we will be maybe hung over from all the purchasing we've done at the end. I'm just kidding. I think the only thing I'll say to the Lodoers, there's a lot of people around me even that are first time Lodoers this year. So just like when you right. fast, we recommend if you're going to fast from food, don't fast whether you fast for a day or two days or whatever. It's not really the right response at the end of your fast to then say, let's go to the Golden Corral and stuff our face. So don't don't come out of Lodo and go, okay, I've got my list. I'm just going to buy back everything that I waited on. Just ease into it. I'm not saying that there's not legit purchases that you have to delay, but do your best to, to kind of re-enter gradually into yeah. the normal rhythms of buying and, and spending. Yeah. <clears throat> Stay low to the ground. It's good for we, your soul. We did have a, some listener feedback last week that said, with all our talk of Texas cafeterias, he felt that we had given the the shaft to the Golden Corral. So hey. that's you out there listening. That's why I, I threw it in here. I put a little bit of personal anecdote on the YouTube comments about my experience at the Golden Corral. So okay. anyways, that's not what corral. we're here to talk about today. Yeah. We're, we're specifically talking about paying for secondary education. We're talking about middle school to 12th grade, looking at the educational landscape and, uh, and how we handle that. So I, I don't know how closely you looked at my notes. I hope, I hope I can tell you some of these stats and still amaze and shock you with them. But, uh, I thought it might be helpful for us to get, just give folks that maybe aren't reading data, stats, and facts all the time, a little bit of a snapshot of what public education looks like these days. You might have heard, oh, troubles, you know, they can't get kids to learn how to read in Baltimore, et cetera. But how, how bad is it across the board? Well, the Brookings Institute tells us that between 2015 and 2021, there was a 32% decline in public school enrollment. Now, our numbers aren't going down as a nation, like just the number of people that live here, but a third of people stopped enrolling in public education. So one, they're making different choices, or two, they're dropping out of school. There is an inadequate supply of quality teachers across the board. Every single state include, experienced shortages last year where they said, we, you know, we can't find an eighth grade math teacher. So we're just going to have to, to shuffle kids around. My observation is that being a school teacher is just not seen as an aspirational career anymore. I have family members who love kids, who want to educate kids, and they found public school systems to be intolerable in that there was no discipline in the children. You're no longer have the ability to enforce discipline, like to develop it in your students if they don't walk in the door with it. There are low expectations academically and low expectations behaviorally. So it is really like herding cats in a classroom. So I have had family members who have said, I I've got to hit the eject button. I, I can't stay in the system. I'm not making a difference. That's not the thing that I loved and wanted to get into it for. The National Center for Education Statistics, a branch of the Education Department, delivers something called the Nation's Report Card every year. Here's the latest. Math and reading scores 
have been declining since 2012, just a regular decline of our scores from our nation's schools. The most recent report reveals declining math and reading scores with a steeper drop off since 2019, which would make sense because somebody decided let's not go to school for a while. History scores among middle schoolers are the lowest ever recorded right now. So they've been recording this, they've been doing this education department thing to about 40 years, and they're getting the lowest scores ever recorded. Only 36, I found this to be a staggering little snapshot, only 36% of fourth graders are proficient at fourth grade math just proficient in their grade level at math. Education Secretary Arne Duncan estimated that 82% of this country's public schools are failing. What? The guy who's in charge of all public schools says 82% of all of our schools are failing. So the problem is that pu- is the public school system, which costs, I don't know if you saw this, do, could you take a guess at how much money states and the and the federal government put towards schools in a year's time? I know that here in Utah, it's over twelve thousand dollars per kid. Okay. I think that's a little bit higher than the total national average. Am I right about that? You are okay, but I, it's still it's it's not free. The gross number from states and f- the federal government is. $795 billion annually that they dump towards schools. Our educational system is a failure at, drum roll, educating children. That's what they're not good at. The national average, back to your point of you said in Utah, it's 12000 a kid. It's over $9,000 per student per year. I want you to just do a little math in your brain of take each of your kids times nine grand a year and imagine what you could do with nine grand a year per child. Do you think you could educate them? Do you think you could teach them how to read? It is insane. And I have to pour one out for Jimmy Carter here. I always think of him as our Baptist president. He's the one that invented the terrible Department of Education. When the Department of Education was invented, we were number one educated country in the world. We are now between number 13 and number 24, based on which metric you you choose. It's not going good. So, thoughts? Well, a couple things. Update, because right. that, that number you said, the decline was, what, 32%? from 2015 to 2021 and I went well oh, that's just that's just the pandemic everybody went home so I looked at the the rest of that chart from 2020 to 2021 it went way back up and then from 2021 to 2023 it's like people came back to public school and they went uh, no thanks and they left again so it actually went shooting back down which is very interesting to me it's not just COVID that caused that that drop and the only other thought I have is that, you know, if we're going to talk about the different school options, but if if kids were getting just a stellar education for $9,000 a year, that's a smoking deal. As somebody who's very involved with helping run a school, that's not that's not a lot of money to just crush it with educating kids. When you think about programs and academics and teachers and administrators and all that, that's not what's happening, though. For $9,000 a year, we're getting kids who can't read real good. So it's a frustrating number here in Utah. There's been a huge fight over something you guys have in Ohio, which is school choice, where you can, while you have students in school, in certain circumstances, you can take a chunk of your tax dollars and put them towards your kid's school wherever you want. And you would think that would just be a no-brainer. Of course. Here in Utah, like I said, it costs them $12,000 just to have one of my kids sitting in their classrooms. They kicked and screamed and wouldn't allow it for 8000 of those dollars to go to me so that I could put my kid wherever I wanted. And it would still save them money versus if I put my kid in their school where they're going to spend twelve and fail. So a little frustrating, but what should we yeah. do if this is the landscape? Right. So that's the state of the world. And you as a family leader are 
probably, if you live in a city, which most of you do, you're probably not delighted with the public school options presented to you. And you think, well, I like to be a play along guy, but I'm being forced into a, a hard decision here. So let's just review the non-public school options that are available to you. And then we'll get into paying for it. So number one, I, I, I say this it, it, with trying to believe the best, you know, I, I, there are, I know uh, of public schools on the periphery of big cities in Texas, where there's a small community, people really know each other. So I'm going to say that the first option could be that you just get really involved at your local public school. So you run for the board, you know the teachers, hopefully you see them at church, you band together with other families, you know all the parents of all the kids that your kids are running around with. And you help sustain or create a culture of learning and achievement and proficiency and excellence. You're part of the solution to the, to the national problem. You don't believe in meaningless affirmation or participation trophies. You believe in rigorous study and learning. You believe in kids like actually making good grades on hard tests. You're just a participant in that system. That, that has to start at home, by the way. For, for anybody that believes in an excellent education for their kids, you can't do the thing that had to happen in generations past, Mark, which is like, like I check my kid in and then I, when I check them out, they're learned. And it's like, great, that worked great. I, I don't think that's an option. And I'll just throw out that most people don't have the option that, that I'm describing of being super involved with a small group of families most people are not connected to the administration of a big school and the teaching staff of a big school. I went to a huge school. My mom for a while worked as the bookkeeper at our school. So she knew a handful of teachers. I mean, she knew the principal, but there were so many things. I mean, I, I went to school with thousands and thousands of, of people, this gigantic school in Houston. She did not have the power to influence that school outside of a couple of relationships. Also, many public schools these days, I just have to throw this mm -hmm. in, doesn't matter how many people you know or how much influence you have, the system itself is so staunchly progressive and aggressively push the LGBTQ agenda kind of scene down your throat that you think, even if my kid did really good on a calculus exam, I don't... I don't even care if the scores are good. I'm not going to subject my eight-year-old to be conformed into that image where I'm not doing that. So I understand all of that. That can be a non-starter. I'm just trying to start with the first option. I think could be in an ideal world, we kind of play as if we're in public schools in the 1970s and, and there's this band of families that are kind of making it happen. Yeah, so it sounds like you're describing... If you were to go this public school option, it's going to be maybe almost as much work uh, on your part as a parent as if you were doing a homeschool option or Perhaps. highly involved in another. Like you're saying, I've got to roll my sleeves up and basically be present in that environment yes. because of where we're at. Yes. Okay. Yep. That's, uh, yeah, I think that's that's some cold water to the face. Second option, which has to be represented in that in that big checkout that Americans have done since 2019, is homeschooling. Now, homeschooling used to be the most bizarre freaks who did not w want their kids to be part of the machinery of society. And so they'd go live out in the hills and they're they're out there churning butter. But homeschooling has hit its stride in an outrageous way in the United States. It's not weird. My children who have been homeschooled for part of their education, we participate in the local public schools sports. So we'll go mix with kids and we're not the only homeschooling family and none of the public school kids think, well, you're what? You're homeschooled? Everybody kind of gets it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And especially after this COVID thing where they go like, oh, you school at home. Yeah, we have a feeling for what that would be like. The thing about homeschooling that I just want to throw out there, if you're kind of looking at the future of education, is the learning curve is quite steep. 
for getting into this world. It's very daunting to start going, okay, I'm going to start with me and uh, this People magazine I have laying around, and I'm going to come up with a school somehow under my own roof. The costs include, got to be number one, is mom's time. So just add running a school on top of any of her housekeeping duties, the keeping food in, getting meals going, taking care of the new baby, and yeah, ma- invent a school from the ground up. Good <laughs> gravy. You you know, you might you might go back and listen to a, one of our episodes about house help if you have the financial margin to do so. This, this is a great little point that homeschool usually sucks if dad is involved at some level. Yeah, that, I think that's true. Uh, if you say, well, my wife's really going to make some sacrifices to educate these kids and I'll come home and kick your shoes off and sit down in front of the TV and you say, man, I'm just so proud of the homeschooling work that our family does. Uh, no, I've never seen it work well when dad just says, I don't take any part in that. No, I agree. It seems to me that dad should be a, a backstop for being like a principal who's like affirming mom's plan and going, you know, if you have any trouble ministrating or dealing with discipline during the day, I'm here to back you up. And I've also found that what works really well is if there's something that dad particularly is good at, say math, that mom can just say, when dad gets home, one day a week, he tries to get home at 4.30 so that he can cover that. Just to have something where dad feels like a guest teacher in the homeschool works really well. To keep him involved, abreast of what's going on, that seems like a really healthy thing. Yeah. So mom also has to go find a curriculum. This is like step one. And how do I build a school? Well, go find a curriculum. You've got a piecemeal together. What's going to be your science deal? What's going to be your literature deal? What's going to be your math machine? And these things are big decisions. I mean, we used to go to the homeschooling convention. It's a conference that happened here in Cincinnati, a regional conference every year. And there are 10 different companies that are trying to pitch you why their system for learning math is the most easily apprehendable to a five-year-old. And can't you see how this leads up to algebra for a 13-year-old? Isn't this great? And you're trying to sample these things, trying to remember back what, how did I learn? I mean, it's crazy, but that it, it is a job that, that if you want to homeschool next year, start now. Start now preparing and putting together curriculum. I'll just throw in that that all this setup costs a lot. It costs a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. If you've got get kids in three different grades and you have to find curriculum that meets all of the needs of every single kid for a whole you know spate of their educational needs, you, you are outlaying some cash, not to mention all of your time. So another deal is you've got to get approval from your local public schools to even be recognized as your legitimate homeschooling family. Otherwise, you'll be considered delinquent from the public school. So you've got to go through some paperwork rigmarole and you actually have to go to your local public school and check in with them and say, now we're going to be doing this. And then they roll their eyes at you and go, I don't even know where the form is for that. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, so that's part of the uphill climb is that you've got to deal with the paperwork and become official. You also have to cobble together any outside activities as your interests dictate. Well, we want our kid to be in soccer. Well, let me guess. There's not a soccer program built into your homeschool. So you're going to have to go find that. Well, my kid wants to do art and we want a spinning wheel. (laughs) We want a pottery thing. Okay, go find private pottery classes somewhere. It's just like, it's just like finding piano lessons. Well, do you know somebody? Do you know somebody that knows somebody? And you've got to put together your sports activities. And I want my kid to learn about birding. Great. That's wonderful. You're going to have to find an expert in that and make time for it. That's kind of one of the things about homeschooling that, that was a, carrot on the end of the stick to me, which was I could teach my kids anything. That sounds so fun to me. There are things I would love to teach my kids. I'd love to make it an official class in their school is 
how to do the pick and roll. This is something dad really wants to teach his kids. We're going to do basketball. We're going to go over the intricacies of pick and roll. You know, whatever it is that you're interested in, you, fly fishing. I, I live in Colorado. I want my kids to fly fish for two hours every Thursday morning. Great. It just takes a lot of work to put that stuff together. And we did some of this. It's really fun to make that stuff up on the go and make that part of your curriculum. It's also a lot of work. I'm just throwing these out. If you've got young ones, you got a three-year-old and you're considering what are we going to do? I want you to know that this is part of the trouble that comes from homeschooling. And the, the last thing I just throw in, this is probably maybe the first thing that comes to mind when people, when we talk about homeschooling is mom can go a little nuts with homeschooling because you are stuck staring at these same four kids all day, every day. And there are times when we need to leave and just go to a grocery store so I can see another adult human. And that is definitely one of the challenges of homeschooling. It's, it's one of the many reasons that people do the next thing, which is like having a co-op machine so that they can kind of do some blending. But those are the struggles that I see with homeschooling. Anything you'd add to that? No, I would just say on that last point, I've seen a lot of families get sort of stuck in the, we actually have zero capacity for anything except this one thing. And you might say, okay, that's fine. That's the stage we're in and that's the decision we've made. And I don't think we'll fault you for that. But if your wife is discipling women and serving in other places in the church and like has a hobby or all that stuff, it's possible that making this choice means sacrifice of almost all of those things. Or, like I sort of referenced before, make sure you come up with a sharing system so that it's not the case for your family that, well, if we're going to homeschool, we won't be seen by our community for the next four years. <laughs> yeah. I'll also just throw in on that sort of that isolation deal. The caricature of the homeschooled kid is this socially backwards kid who wears homemade clothes and a hat made out of yarn and has bad teeth and is scared of adults. You know, that is a caricature for a reason. And that's because it really does happen. Hang around the homeschool convention, everybody. Just go. No, no, really. Just go spend time. And there are people that are great. There are people that you go like, wow, what they're doing with their family is so commendable, amazing. And there are people that, you know, like there's eight kids holding on to a rope, you know, and everyone's dressed like a miniature of mom. And that character is real. And none of us wants to have raise children that this is going to get to a, a future point of yours, Mark, but who cannot operate in 2024, who cannot eat, I always use this phrase, eat culture, you know, like being able to consume it, digest it, parse it out, go, that's good, that's poison, this is neutral. People who cannot interpret signals and modern messages from culture because they just don't know it. They don't know what people are like. They don't know what brash people are like. They're not exposed to the world. Now, I'm not talking about five-year-olds here. I'm talking about a 15-year-old who doesn't know how to look a man in the eye and shake his hand. That's a problem. A 15-year-old girl who can't speak back when spoken to, that's a problem. So there's kind of a culture of backwardness in the homeschooling world. And it's not for no reason. It, it really does exist. And as you say, if the entire family's engineered around the schooling of these little ones, and that is what we do, and that's all we do, that can be a problem. So it's kind of one of the pitfalls of going down that road. And now I'm sick of talking about homeschooling. Yeah, we got we to gotta cover two more so we can get to how the heck we're supposed okay, to Okay, we can do this second one uh, really fast, which is the co-op or hybrid model which is usually like half time at home and half time somewhere else. So it's either a collection of families who have come together and this mom kind of gets math. Well, she could kind of cover math. This mom really likes literature. She could kind of cover literature. 
and you get the families together at some place. Oftentimes it's a church that'll let you use their property in the middle of the week, some public center, you know, libraries have meeting rooms or whatever, and you do a little co-oping kind of thing. And those can have varying levels of professionalism. Oh, that's the, what we're doing right now, which is our kids are home a couple of days a week and a couple of days a week, they're at a school where there are really good teachers teaching really great Bible classes and Latin and they're getting a good kind of classical education from really good teachers and they're not there all week. There's this blending thing that happens. There still has to be somebody that sets up the home base. There has to be a space, physical space for what's happening. Somebody has to look through that curriculum, sign off on it. Okay, we're happy with what's happening here. We want to add this, add that. Somebody might be handling the lion's share of teaching and Somebody else can be orchestrating the curriculum. That's great. You follow along. It, it, that's one of the great things about like what we have is that they said, here's what we'll be covering. So get this done on your off days at home. Well, great. We can follow along pretty good. That's nice. But I can tell you this, hiring part-time staff and a good administration, but not offering them a full-time job just saying, we just need you a couple days a week. Now, we want to be really good. We want you to be like master's degree level of proficiency, but we only need you a couple days a week. Guess what, folks? That's going to be pricey. That's going to be pricey to try to get good people at half time. So it is a very pricey option and it works for some people. Your kids will mix with other kids. There might be like a sports program in some big co-ops, usually not. But it hands off some of the burden of teaching and, like I said, finding curriculum. But there's still still home help that has to happen. I mean, when your kids are little, you got to spend all day with them working through that. And as they age out, you have to spend less and less time helping them through getting through their day's work. That's the co-op hybrid model. Lastly is the private school system. There's this crazy. I mean, everybody's aware of private schools, but it's kind of crazy to think that there is this kind of off the grid private school machine where somebody can just hang up a shingle and go, we're starting a private school. We want to be accredited. And there's this just random scattering of, you don't know. I mean, you don't know, are you going to be in in a hotbed of great schools and you get to choose? And when you do, guess what? because of free market forces, prices will come down. Or you could be like Mark's situation, or how many great Christian private schools are there for you? There's one in the state of of Utah, (laughs) one. Okay, one. So uh, you're a captive audience. If you want that scene, you can either go start your own school or you'll go to this school. So most private schools are religious. They have some kind of Christian background to them. Here's a question. I don't know if you've worked through this. Do we agree with the religious slant of this school? I was a Baptist kid. I went to a private school early on in my elementary years, and it was a Church of Christ school. So there were things that were taught to me in school that I'd get home and report and my parents said, okay, hold on a second. Now we we don't believe, we don't believe this exactly. For, For instance, we don't exactly believe that if you're not baptized in water, you cannot go to heaven. So this is a church of Christ belief that when someone is born again, you must get them into physical water as soon as possible. So I have memories of like being in recess, running around in the gym And uh, they would interrupt recess because the minister had found somebody who had decided to follow Jesus. And they're going to have a baptism uh, on the stage of the gym during school. And we're going, what, what, what's all this? So, you know, that there are a lot of Catholic schools and you might go, I'm not comfortable with Catholic stuff being taught to my kids. Or you might go, well, we are Catholic. And we're at some school where they're not doing Catholic stuff. So you have to kind of wade through all of those waters. It's almost always pricey. Private schools don't have the huge pocketbooks of the public school system. Again, we're trying to get high quality teachers in here. Not just teachers that really know their subjects well, but teachers that share our worldview and are going to be sharing a biblical worldview as they teach. You're hiring 
pool is getting smaller and smaller and it costs money. This might be the best educational option. Generally speaking, these students do very well. I remember you went to a school. I keep thinking of your school in Dallas, Mark, where you went to school and it was like, it was called an academy, but it was basically like a prep school, right? I mean, the kids that graduated from your high school went to fantastic colleges. Is that right? Yes. And I think the biggest testament to that, that I have to that school is when we got to those colleges, we said we feel very comfortable kind of being top notch in this environment too. So it really, it was all targeted at, can we prepare you for academic excellence? So I had a good experience in that regard. Yeah. I think there's a couple other things if you want me to chip in on on private school because this is one that we obviously have personal experience with. But Mark, why don't you chip in on some of this private oh, school okay, stuff? Okay. In your experience, have you found them to be a cheap option? No. Okay. Yeah. Usually private school is pricey. And unless you're in sort of a very unique situation or have financial aid that can cover the cost. That's a huge consideration for most families. And also, I think that there's a lot of kind of frames you have to run your selection process through when you're looking at private schools. One of them is, is this a school that you could be very deeply involved in? So I go back to what we talked about on public school or a hybrid co-op or any place where you're sending your kids. It's just not an option that you're going to say, well, I picked a good place and best of luck, child. I'll see you tonight. Like, I really believe that mom and dad need to have involvement in any organization or place where their child is going to spend a long time uh, out of their week. So can you be on the board? Can you teach sometimes? Like, in that regard, smaller is often much more amenable to that. So our kids go to a relatively small school, and my wife and I both have things that we are kind of gifted in, kind of like you said was exciting about homeschool. It's very easy for me to call them up and go, hey, I'd like to come talk about personal finance with the seniors. And they're like, hallelujah, that sounds great. Come on in. So there's a lot of opportunity there. I'm going to argue that if you're talking about private Christian school, and really even public school, I could, I could make this argument, the families that are a part of that community are more important than the teachers or the beliefs that the school publicly espouses. So if you had a cohort of 100 dead set, kingdom minded Jesus followers, you could send those kids to a public school where the teacher's like, I hate your beliefs and I'm going to try to convince you otherwise. And I believe that those kids will turn out just fine because they're all from families where they go, we know what we're about and where we're headed versus we've seen this in a lot of the Catholic school system. You've got a bunch of devout nuns with the best of intentions, but the families don't give a crap about the kind of theology and the uh, religious training that's trying to be instilled in people. And you end up with kids that have zero grounding. So I've seen that in Christian schools. One question to ask a private school when you're thinking about it, if you're going this route, is are you a covenantal school or not? And I didn't know what that meant until I got into this world. But what it means is, is there an expectation that the families that are part of this school will have some association with Christ? Or is this school open to anybody who would like to send their kids here? And we can talk another time about kind of the arguments there. Some people like one or the other. I talk to people all the time who say, well, I want my kids to, to be missionaries in the in school environment that they're in. And I say, you will be sending your children into a mission field if you send them into a school full of people who are hostile to their beliefs. You are mistaken about who the missionaries will be. The assumption that a 10-year-old is going to go win a school for Christ is parental malpractice. Your yeah, job is to cruel. disciple them and build them up. It's like we talked about with new believers because we don't stick them in a pulpit and say, preach, because they need a lot of time to grow and be rooted and, and developed in their faith. Well, your kids are the same way. If you want to send your kid to 
a public high school because they're just really anchored and there's something they need to get there. I'm not going to make that declaration that it's impossible, but um, I don't like the argument. So that's kind of the private school world. My last point is you can blend all of these. And I see a ton of families go, well, mom doesn't really want to teach multivariate calculus to our high school kids, but she's very comfortable teaching the kids to read. So we're going to start pure homeschool. Maybe we're going to go hybrid for a few years. And then maybe we're going to send them to a private school for high school. That's a fine option. I think it works out really well for a lot of families. Yeah, that's been our path. So I think we've got people convinced that schooling is extremely costly, no matter how you do it. It, it, You have to spend time and money way beyond what the average American nuclear family does if you want to raise godly, smart, educated children. And how are you supposed to afford this? That's, that's, that's what we're about here at Abraham's Wallet is how you steward money in a kingdom-minded household. Yeah. This is probably in the top two topics that people come to me asking about is education funding. And historically, I think that used to be, how are we supposed to pay for college? It's so expensive. Yes. More and more and more, we're saying... Well, forget about college. How are we supposed to pay for whatever option of these things we chose for now? How are we supposed to pay now? And so I want to talk about that. Great. Please give us some wisdom. Well, the the thing I'm going to focus on a little bit is school models, because we talked about those being pricey. Like we said, homeschooling is also expensive. There's not nearly as many tricks and tips in the bag when it comes to funding the costs of homeschool or funding the time expense that you're going to need. But when it comes to private school and some co-op models and hybrid models, there's a lot of tricks out there to maximize how far your dollar goes. Probably the most common one is a 529 plan. So a lot of people think a 529 plan, that's for saving for college. Well, as long as you don't live in one of these states, California, Colorado, Hawaii, Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, Montana, Nebraska, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, and Vermont, if you go back through that list, there's not a whole lot of states I just named that are places you necessarily would would call highly supportive culturally of kingdom-minded households. But in any case, if you don't, those states say you can't use a 529 plan at all for primary and secondary education. But if you don't live one of those states, most states have adopted kind of the federal recommendation, which is you can use your 529 plan up to $10,000 per year to pay for K through 12 education. Can you use those funds to pay for homeschool expense? No, you cannot. So like you said, Steve, there's expensive curriculum purchases and things like that. You can't pull out of a 529 plan. There are state programs, like I know here in Utah, the state will send you tax credits to help offset those costs. You got to just investigate that on a state by state basis. But if you, let's say you are sending your kids to a private school and you live in Utah or Ohio, you can take $10,000 out of that plan per year to pay for that cost. Now, if you're listening to this and going, well, I don't have anything in a 529 plan, you still might want to set one up. Because in some states, I was looking at South Carolina recently, there's virtually, there is a cap, but it's like $600,000, virtually no cap to how much tax deduction they will give you in their 529 plans. So if you have a $10,000 a year expense for private school, you can put $10,000 into your 529 plan on day one. On day two, you can take it out and pay private school tuition for your kid. And then when you go to pay taxes, the state of South Carolina goes, you don't owe us taxes on any of that money because it went into your 529 plan and then you used it for a qualified expense. So that's a great way to make your private school 6% cheaper if you're a South Carolinian. And each state has different rules. Utah, you're allowed to do this. Ohio, you're allowed to do this. Each state has different calculations for how much of a tax break they're going to give you. So some states in Utah, it's up to, I think, $4,500. So it's not going to cover most, most private schools are going to cost more than that per year. But I tell people, if you're going to private school, cycle the money through a 529 plan if your state allows you to do it, because you might as well get the tax break, even if it's a thousand bucks a year, that's valuable. 
Yeah. So, okay. Let's say that your goal is I want my first grader to be in a private school, but you just got married. And so you don't have a 529 program. Could we be putting money aside in a little savings account? And then the the day that we have a child, we open up 529 and shove a bunch of money in there? Is that the suggestion? You can do it more and more. What I am seeing is that there is that tax benefit, right? And we can always get that when the time comes by just cycling the money through the 529. When we think about a 401k, we get real excited about tax deferred savings because the money grows tax free. And typically, if you start one when you're 24, that that money might have 45 years to grow before you start pulling from it. That's hot. Meaningful. Hot. It's a lot less meaningful if you have a brand new baby and you're like, well, I'm going to start pulling this money when they're seven. It's not nothing to get seven years of tax-free growth, but the difference between how it would grow in a 529 plan and how it would grow in a taxable account is not that big. And so for that reason, a lot of the families I work with end up going, we would like to do the saving in a taxable brokerage account where it can still grow, be invested in the market, and we have zero restrictions on how we use it. So if we need to tap into that money for homeschool expenses, we can do it. I didn't mention this, but the whole strategy I just talked about, sometimes that works with a hybrid model and sometimes it doesn't. So what you need to find out is if the particular co-op or hybrid model you're looking at qualifies with your state as a school or not, and that'll determine whether you can use 529 money there. But my, my bias these days is more and more towards let's maintain maximum flexibility with money. And you could always grow the money in your taxable account you leave it in there for 10 years and then you're like, oh, it's time. We're going to do private school. Well, I'm just going to run it through the 529 to get the tax benefit at that time. Uh-huh. I lost out a little bit on kind of the taxes as the money grew, but it's it's a pretty marginal amount. So that's that's how I think about saving and starting really early. And you can't start a 529 until you have a kid to attach it to. You can start a taxable account if you're one of our stud 17 or 18 year old dudes listening to this who are wanting to fund a family someday you could start that taxable account now and put 50 bucks a month in it you'd have you'd have a year or two of school paid for awesome. by the time you were married very likely so there's advantages of setting up a 529 moving money into it and as soon as it appears in there spending out of the 529 to fund education there's benefits just for doing that step that's right in most states it's so hard to afford private school when you're 35 and you've got four kids, and you're kind of early to mid-career. But you know when it's not that hard to fund uh, private school is when you're 60, and you're trying to fund it for your great-grandkids that are still 15 or 20 years or 30 years from being born. (laughs) Right. You can put a very small amount of money into your grandkids' name in a 529 and let it grow for... Now we're talking like the 401k, let it grow for 40 years. Yeah. And then it's available to fund your great grandkids. You know, you can skip up to one generation in these 529 accounts. So you can set up the account for a grandchild and they can use it for their kids. So there is actually a way to use these as a multi-generational asset. And, you know, a lot of people talk a big game about wanting to invest multi-generationally. Right. Right but they only invest in things that they get to see and enjoy and use in their lifetimes. Right. Well, that's not thinking multi-generationally. So you might get to a point where you say, one of my goals before I die is to set up funds that can alleviate this burden for two generations down line from me. And that's actually, it doesn't take that much money because of the magic of compound interest. So something to think about with 529s. Well, let's talk about that. I'm very interested in that. So- you're you're 75 years old and you go like, I'm good. I've checked the box on the money that I'm going to need to live on. And what I'm interested in at this point is I'm investing in my grandchildren. I'm interested in trying to create, and we're talking specifically about education today. I'm trying to do inheritance money in a way that will be taken away and taxed the least 
So you could open up a 529 in the name of each of your grandchildren, and you can fund that 10 grand a year? Yeah, so you could fund it right <laughs> now, and this is where we get into <laughs> talk to a professional before you go and do anything wild, but you can fund it up to five years of the gift tax limit all at once. So, you know, between you and your wife, if you were both doing this together, you could put $180,000 wow. all in one shot for each of your grandkids, which that might sound crazy, but when you're 75, you might be sitting on a lot of money sure. and that would be doable. So, and it's also a way to get some funds out of your estate if you're in a estate tax situation. So, Dude. yeah, it's, it's very possible and it's a cool type of account for that purpose. So, so just, I mean, I just would love for this to be something that all of our people consider, you know, if the, if the grandparents are going to give you a gift every time a child is born and little Susie Brown is born and the grandparents say, we want to give a uh, thousand dollars to her college education. And you say, we're working on the college education. What we'd love for you to do is to create a 529 in her name, put the $1,000 in there. And what we're thinking about is that being spent on Susie Brown's children someday. That is really exciting to me. That that, yeah. that seems super cool. I mean, I had a conversation with a parent upline of us where we were talking about inheritance. They had just lost a parent. And I said, and it was a little shocking to this person, would you consider not leaving money to us and leaving it to our children for the same reason? Like we want to push things out. And so usually I think you get met with like, what? Because we're just so used to in our culture kind of waiting to receive that that chunk of money from family. And often it comes when it's not as useful as yes. it could be. So. Before we go, though, I want to just kind of close with some golden rules of education spending that really right. apply to this conversation. Mm -hmm. The number one rule I tell everybody is whatever choice you make on how you're going to do K through 12 education, put on your own oxygen mask before you put on the child's next to you. What I mean by that is you have to be able to afford the basics that you need before you can kind of make extravagant, expensive decisions. And I see this a lot where families go, well, we sacrificed everything to pay for this or that education opportunity for you. And now we have not enough money to buy groceries when we're 75. And that doesn't actually usually serve your, your generation's wealth. Yeah. Um, so think about kind of your own plan first. Number two, and this one, Stephen, tell me if I'm too harsh on the people, but you can't assume that because something is a value that you're entitled to it. So for example, private school, we just, it's a must for us. So we're doing it every year. Even if we make $150,000 a year, have a $600,000 house and need two big vacations a year, we, it's, it's a value for us. So it's a must. And I, to that, I say, great. It can, it can be a must. Like, it sounds like this this hypothetical family, they make enough money to afford a lot of private school options. However, they might have to live in a two-bedroom apartment. Like, that's a real possibility. So when I see people get in huge trouble is when they assume that because something is a noble goal of theirs, that they're entitled to it right. without making dramatic, sometimes, sacrifices oh. in other areas of life. You're preaching now. That's good. Keep going homeschool families, sometimes they really get this. They're like, homeschooling is really important to us and we're sacrificing, you know, mom has an MBA. She could make $200,000 a year and we're punting it because yep. this is a value. Specifically in private school land, I see a lot of, of this get ignored and families grind themselves into debt and, and they do it all thinking, well, we're just doing what the Lord wants for us. No, you're not. You're, you're actually failing to to make wise trade-offs with your money so just budget to zero that's so good we have a way of talking ourselves into if i really really want it 
and I could see that it would be really, really good, then I deserve to have it. Even if we can't technically afford it on paper. If you can't technically afford it on paper, you can't have it and have God's approval of what's happening with your money. Sorry, sorry, young ones. That's the truth, is that responsibility with your money includes take, making hard choices and going, well, we can't do that and that and that and still be in the black at the end of the month. Right. So I know that one of your golden rules for budgeting, Mark, is even if you pay for schooling nine months of the year, it should be on your budget 12 months of the year. We should be planning for it and paying for it throughout the year because it's part of it's part of the way that our family works. And again, if you don't come out in the black, you need to reconsider what you're doing for your vacations. You need to reconsider which cars you're driving. You need to reconsider where you're living because something's got to give. I, I think I can definitively tell you it's not God's will that you run a household in the red. It's not. And don't try to fool yourself that, well, we just love our neighbors. And I we really love these suburbans because we can, you know, we can take friends around when we need to. And this school is just so good. They teach them Bible. And so I know that we have to have all of those things. No, you don't. You don't have to have all those things just because they're good and because you like them. Yeah. And don't fool yourself. I mean, part of the, what comes with choosing a expensive private school is that you tend to have a lot of families concentrated who have a lot of money such that they aren't bothered by not just the tuition, but mm -hmm. the sports costs, the debate, That's true. the senior trip. Maybe their kids are driving new cars. And so it just creates one more place where if you're like, we're stretching as far as we can to afford this thing. And now, crap, we are amongst people whose lives are in a totally different financial that spot so than true. ours. That can be dangerous for you, too. So, again, I am not saying that a family can't make this decision where this particular school option is the, the right answer for them. But they have to be absolutely ready to sacrifice to make sure that they're budgeting to zero. And just because education is a key value and important to and all that does not make it an exception to that rule I just said. Hey, if you liked this content, be sure to like it and subscribe and share it with somebody. And remember, no matter how you're doing and leading your family, God's love for you is huge and his grace is greater.